We are focusing on 2024, folks, and uh, many are out there putting together their post-spring top 25s, including, as uh, was communicated to me before we started the live stream by Steve, Joel Klatt with his uh, spring top 25. So I got to say, I'm not very aware of, nor do I delve into other people's top 25, so I'm not aware of Joel Klatt's. We will pull it up here in just a second, but Steve's got some thoughts on maybe the best in the business is top 25. Yeah, I know you had Ohio State number one, I think Georgia two, Texas three. And uh, after that, um, let me see, I had it in my chat last night. Exactly. Uh, I wrote, let me see. Oregon four, Ole Miss five is what I'm showing on our message board. Okay. Yeah. Those are your top five. And I think, um, you know, a pretty representative group. I think Alabama checks in there in the top 10 somewhere. Uh, Michigan and Penn State might be in the top 12. Um, Nebraska and Iowa are in the top 25 down toward the bottom. Um, I'm at a loss. Well, USC has got to be I've, in the top 10 as well. I've got, I've got yeah. it right here. Um, okay. So, yeah, Michigan is eight. Penn State is nine. USC is 15. Welcome to the Big Ten. Welcome to the Big Ten. And Nebraska, 22, the Dylan Riola bounce. And Iowa, 24, another Big Ten team. And that looks like it's it uh, yeah. for the Big Ten. Future Big Ten team, Florida State, number 12. Ah, there you go. They're all – anybody who's not in the SEC or the Big Ten now – is future SEC or future Big Ten, it feels like. But but we digress. Um, my major misgiving with Ohio State has been the offensive line. And Dave Biddle and myself did a deep dive on, dive on the offensive line today. And um, maybe I'm coming around a little bit on it. Uh, four of the five spots seem to be etched in stone with uh, – Josh Simmons at left tackle, Donovan Jackson left guard, Seth McLaughlin at the center position, and Josh Fryer about 94% certain uh, to be the right tackle. Uh, they could be scouring the transfer portal to find a starter, a fifth starter for this group. The right guard position seems a little bit problematic with Carson Hensman, who started at center last year, kind of ended up the spring there, along with Ryan Montgomery and Tegritosh Bola, who also reps at tackle. So if they find a tackle in the transfer portal, maybe Fryer would move inside to guard. Or if they find a guard, then that person could compete with those other ones for the guard position. And, you know, so what? <laughs> if they don't have the Joe Moore award-winning offensive line. I did uh, research here on this as we were coming on the air. And did you know Ohio State won the national championship in 2002 and 2014 without benefit of very many National Football League offensive linemen? I can read to you the starting offensive lines for those two teams. 2002, Ivan Douglas and Shane Olivier at tackle, Adrian Clark and Bryce Bishop at guard, and Alex Stepanovich at center. And of those five, I think only Alex Stepanovich played appreciable time in the National Football League. I guess Shane Olivier did as well, just a little bit. But I don't think Douglas Clark or Bishop ever played much or at all in the National Football League. And then you fast forward to 2014, and the starters were Taylor Decker and Daryl Baldwin at the tackle positions. Decker still playing in the NFL a decade later uh, with the Lions. I guess he'd be a nine. Well, yeah, was he a senior that year? A nine-year vet. And then uh, Billy Price, who did bounce around the NFL for a few years, uh, and Pat Elfline at the guards. Tony, is Pat still in the NFL? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm sure he's trying to hang on, but it never really yeah. clicked for him. Yeah, it never really clicked. And then Jacoby Boren, who was never an NFL 
uh, prospect uh, either. So out of those two offensive lines, you've got three, maybe four guys who made NFL careers out of playing on the offensive line. So maybe my major misgiving, and I'm not saying you can hide a bad offensive line. I'm not saying Ohio State's got a bad offensive line, but you can win it without having all Americans at all five positions, I guess. So, uh, and that may be what Ohio State has to do. And that may very well be what Ohio State goes out and does uh, this coming season because, uh, you know, it didn't look and feel a whole lot better this spring than it did last spring. But then again, some of that could be we saw a lot more of the backups out there at critical times. And the older guys were kind of kept out because they'd had that rep club exemption. You know, they'd done so much already that there was like Donovan Jackson. What's he got to prove? Seth McLaughlin, he could snap the ball. Okay, grab a ball cap and go over there. You know, so, uh, you know, it wasn't necessary for those guys to be out there grinding, uh, you know, 70 plays a day in practice. So, and then maybe some breakdowns with the backups, but, uh, I do like seven or eight guys deep on this offensive line. I just want to see it. And I think this is a situation where we'll get into mid-October when the bullets really start flying for this team and the challenges after the Michigan State game start becoming real, that that we'll have a better idea what this offensive line can do. I can go back to that 2002 where – Rob Sims and Nick Mangold as freshmen really started to yep. uh, play and, and bolster that line and made it better. They um, both played more in the NFL than anybody who started on that team. Yeah. You know, ahead um, of them. And then um, with, you know, compared to last spring, we've said it before, and the last year when they left spring, it was Josh Fryer at left tackle, Zen Maholsky at right tackle, and Carson Hinsman battling Vic Cutler to be your center. So like, it's, it's a world of difference between now and then, in my opinion. And as we talked about last week or the week before, there's nobody out there in the portal for on the offensive line. So you're, you're going to bring in another Vic Cutler type. If you're going to bring somebody in, unless a graduate jumps in, I don't even know if a graduate can jump in at this point any longer, but I, there's been no mention of, uh, hosting offensive linemen at this point. So I'm I'm of the opinion that they feel good enough, certainly better than they did a year ago when they're trying to find three guys and one of them is going to be a brand new center. So you're now you're just – if you go into every year just trying to find the right guard, you'll an offensive line coach will take that 10 times out of 10. The head coach will take that every single year. If that's all you're worried about and you've got three or four guys that could start there any given year, that's not really, uh, you know, they've had bigger problems than that. So I, I think they're going to be okay there. And, you know, that's, there's just, you know, I could scroll through and we talked about it last week, you know, the, the, the top offensive linemen that could help would be, we're in like the four sixties and four eighties and, and the top offensive lineman in the portal a week or two ago was a true freshman. And that's not what you're looking for because Ohio state has four of them. Yeah, not to excuse their issues along the offensive line or excuse their lack of recruiting up front or their player acquisition, but hardly anyone is ever satisfied with their offensive line. If you look at uh, media coverage across the country and dissecting offensive lines, hardly anyone is ever pleased with or believes that they don't have issues along the offensive line. That said... I understand your point, Steve, in recent weeks about getting by with a, let's say, better than mediocre, decent offensive line. I don't know whether I agree with that or I disagree with that, so I'm not going to argue it because I don't necessarily disagree with it, but I don't necessarily agree with it either. I would have to do a lot of digging because when I think best offensive lines in the country, and this is very anecdotal and it's very reputation based and not grinding down to the actual personnel on the field recently. But George has had exemplary offensive lines recently for the most part. Alabama, of course, produces the most NFL offensive linemen. Wisconsin has in the past right there with Alabama. 
Uh, Clemson's been able to, during their 2015 to 2020 run, get by with those decent offensive lines. So there you go with tremendous running back, wide receiver, and quarterback play. Clemson's been an exception to, again, not a great offensive line, not NFL players for the most part, and been able to compete for championships on a regular basis. Of course, our friends to the north uh, rode an offensive line more in 2021 and 22. They had issues at a particular position with uh, Barnhart uh, late in the season that they fixed and mended going into the playoff, and that's what they rode to the championship and they faced a team in Washington that apparently had the best offensive line in the country. They won the award for such. I don't know that that was the case. Uh, so yeah, all that offensive talent is going to make up for an offensive line and the play calling is going to make up for the offensive line. If your play caller knows what he's doing and this guy has quite a bit of experience in that uh, realm but at the same time, it would sure be nice if the quarterback can stand back there and pat the football and uh, the running backs have nice big lanes to run through, especially a Travion Henderson. Yeah, I would argue the last two national champions did not have – they had as good of an offensive line as Ohio State will have this year. I, I don't think you – know, Georgia, from talking to people, there, there were issues – but they were able to get away with it. And Stetson Bennett was outstanding and feeling the pocket and escaping the pocket and making things happen. So I, I think uh, you don't need the best offensive line to win it all. You just need to be better than the defensive line that you're facing that day. And, and not even the entire time, j just enough. And I think Ohio state has the, as a good enough offensive line, if that's like I said, if that's their biggest concern, and, and right now it might be other maybe linebacker, I don't know, but they've got more options than they've had in the past, more options than they had in 2002 and 2014. When you know, 14, when you're putting Daryl Baldwin, a former defensive tackle, defensive lineman at right tackle, and they had to do it what the next year with Chase Ferris as well. So, like, it's been the uh, Things have, things have improved greatly, even if it doesn't look like it at the time. So, Tony, I'll ask you this, and I'll ask Steve to follow up on the same question. What would be your list of why Ohio State did not win a national championship last year, whether that list is 17 items long or one item long? Um, you know, offensive line and Kyle McCord – uh, some accurate accuracy issues and inability to run the ball. I think the lack of quarterback run and not just not running 15 times a day, a game like JT Barrett, the lack of a running threat, the offensive line wasn't good enough to handle that. And I don't, you know, I don't know if the running backs were good enough because you look at the fact that Mayan Williams is not anywhere in camp. I don't think still yet. And you know, injuries have a lot to do with that. Surgery has a lot to do with that, but you know, this is when you, when you're relying on a former linebacker, former running back, you know, and Chip Trainum, Xavier Johnson, like this was not an overly talented running back room, not an overly talented uh, offensive line, and then you go in with a quarterback who has is not going to contribute to the running game at all. You can get get away with that when you've got C.J. Stroud, but he didn't win any national championships either. So I, I think um, the defense did everything it could to win it last year. You just, you know, the the quarterback situation, the lack of a running game, basically the entire offense and losing a Mecca hurt as well. And, and that kind of forced them to enforce Kyle McCord to lock in more on Marvin Harrison, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Tony said. I think, um, you know, Michigan was able to exploit a few things. I mean, uh, against Ohio State's defense, uh, that maybe nobody else was able to do. Um, but ultimately, I think the offense struggled in that game for so long, and it was just such a such a slog, I thought, for the offense. Um, yeah, I mean, they just never were able, it didn't feel like that when they had to get two yards, they could line up and get two yards. And if you can't do that, 
you know, you're not going to win at the highest level in college football. So, um, yeah, I think it was, it was just a, it was just a very difficult season. You had a rookie coordinator, a rookie quarterback, patchwork, I don't say patchwork, just kind of an offensive line, meh, kind of thrown out there, and you lose, um, you know, Buca was out half the year. So, yeah, it just um, – it was a tough, tough go for the offense last year, I think. And I think, Tony, in addition to what you said about McCord's uh, inaccuracy, you would agree because we talked about it so many times last year, his inability to see open receivers mm -hmm. and pull the trigger. Yeah, the, the anticipation, throwing guys open – it wasn't there, and and when he did, the accuracy wasn't necessarily there either. And so, yeah, uh, things were a little bit late or a lot late and just never really ever looked fluid. And you could see it, the the frustration in Ryan Day on the sideline. You can see it after the game during the week where you know he, he's doing everything he can to get this offense going, and it's just not, and it's – they scored, I don't know, something a little over 30 points a game last year. It was the, the first time in Ryan Day's tenure that they were under 40 points a game. And, like, that's – it's just unheard of. You know, it used to be unheard of for Ohio State to score 40 points a game for an entire season. They'd only done it, like, three or four times before Urban Meyer got there and, and then Ryan Day was doing it every year until last year. And so, you know, they've had situations where they couldn't run the ball before. Like, in 2018, they couldn't run the ball, but they still scored a heck of a lot of points. And they did not have great defenses. This year they had a last year they had a really good defense and you know held teams to three and outs and got the ball back, but they still couldn't do anything with it. And so, you know, the, a lot of that's gonna go on uh Kyle McCord. And somebody else mentioned in you know Brian Hartline as the offensive coordinator. Let's not forget losing Kevin Wilson had it was an impactful thing as well when the the eyes in the sky have changed. And Ryan Day is maybe doing a bit more than he had to in the past. And still, you, you could have gotten away with that with like a CJ Stroud. But to use him as an example is kind of – he's the outlier of all outliers as we're seeing in the NFL. But um, they just didn't get enough out of the quarterback position. And this year, I wonder if um, that's all they need to get out of the quarterback position. Because in, in terms of the throwing game, because the quarterback this year will be more of a running threat. So – if, if we, we look at um, Kyle McCord's stats from last year as I, as I pull them up really quickly and, um, you know, great, great, great radio right here. But yeah. McCord throws for 3,170 yards, 24 touchdowns, six interceptions. I think you take that right now from Will Howard because yeah, the, running yes. gonna, the running game is going to be better. So, yeah, there, there's that, – that's a very um, – it's a very Justin Fields kind of uh, number in 2019 when he threw for 3,273 yards in uh, one more game, but it, he had, he did have 41 touchdown passes. That's the number that I think needs to be better. I, I, I think Will Howard needs to throw more than 24 touchdown passes for this team to win a national championship. I wouldn't disagree with you there. 24 is a, is a pretty low number, and it's completely uh, out of the ordinary for what Ryan Day has done. But, you know, he's also been very confident in his quarterbacks to throw from the one, the two, the three-yard line, and you get you get some cheapies that way, and there was the, that confidence wasn't there last year. 